Welcome to Old Fashioned Baptist Church tonight. Thank you for praying for us as we travel. Pastor Dirks and Alex came over from a great meeting. I'll talk about it a little bit more in just a moment. And uh, one of the things that uh, is difficult after a meeting like that is two things. One is this, is you get all fired up and then there's all this stuff you want. You've got all these things, thoughts, and you can't get them all together. You want to preach everything at once. You kind of just unload the truck and that's not, you shouldn't do that. And then the other thing is, you go to the meeting, you stay there, and you're late, and you guys are traveling back and forth and things like that, and you get tired. <laughs> you get tired. And so between the two, but I'm excited for tonight, and I'm excited for especially coming up June 7th here. But let's open the service with a song tonight. Let's sing number 326, Look and Live, number 326 in your hymnal there, 326. Uh, concerning missions and uh, 
that will lead into some specific things I think we should pray for tonight. And so let's go ahead and sing number 377 in our hymnals, 377, and then I'm going to jump right into the preaching tonight. 377, where he leads me. Somewhat heartbreaking because I can think of people where they have an empty seat 
They used to be. And then I thought about, you know what? If I'm not careful, that'll be me. And, uh, and then I thought about my, ch my children, and I thought, you know what? I need, to, I need to beg God for just a special hedge of protection on them so that as when they grow up, it's not an empty seat. You know? They're here now, and they're sitting in church, and that's good, and they have to. They don't have a choice. <laughs> And, uh, but someday they'll have a choice, and I pray that uh, it won't be an empty seat. It won't be an empty seat. Just phenomenal, phenomenal message. Uh, Brother Hudson, on the last uh, last night, he brought a thought. <laughs> He's, it's something he hadn't developed fully, and uh, talked about the, the account of David when he sinned with Bathsheba, and then had Uriah killed. And he didn't emphasize Bathsheba, he didn't emphasize... David, he emphasized Uriah, and, you know, he got the raw end of the deal, didn't he? I mean, think about it. He was out to battle. He was being loyal. He was doing what he was supposed to do. He came back. David called him back to try and cover some things up. He, he stood with character. He said, listen, if my brothers aren't, I'm not going to go back to my house and have at ease while they're on the battlefield sleeping in their tents, can't be with their family. And uh, the title of his message was, is it worth it? Is it worth it? And it was good. You know, if you're right, you speak to us now. What he say was, what everything I did, was it worth it? Was it worth it? And he, would, he says, I think he'd say, it was worth it. It was worth it. You know, a lot of thoughts going on there. It was a blessing. It was a blessing. And if the Lord doesn't come back, and they have their Memorial Day service, and Brother Cox is able to come, Brother Hudson is able to come again, I plan to have my seat there. I hope my seat won't be empty. I want to sit hear these men preach. Anyway, I hope that gave you enough time to get to Matthew chapter number 9. Matthew chapter number 9. I'll say more, a little bit more about it I'll probably on Sunday. I want to encourage people, if they can go to some of these things, to go to them. You know, you hear my voice and uh, you'll hear Pastor Gerson's voice and uh, I'll have him probably preach more periodically coming up uh, in, a, in a bit. Uh, he doesn't know that I haven't talked to him about that, but just I just put him on notice. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I know, are you still planning to go down in September? Are you still planning? Okay. And uh, the restrictions should all be lifted by then, I hope. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, uh, you hear our voices. You know what's nice is to sometimes go to some of these other meetings and hear another, different, another voice. It's not that we say uh, anything different as long as it's in here. But sometimes you just get a, somebody taking the, that same nail that's been hit, and they, they hit it just in a little different angle. And sometimes it sticks a little better. And uh, so it's good to be around. I like preaching. I like, I like doing it. I like listening to it. It doesn't matter whether it's long, short, loud, quiet. As long as it's Bible, I like it. <laughs> and so Matthew chapter number 9 tonight, we're going to go to verse number 35, uh, common verses. Uh, many of you know, probably have it memorized. Let's go ahead and stand for the reading of God's word tonight. I'll give you one chance to stretch your legs. And uh, verse number 35, it says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So Jesus, listen to this. Jesus was busy. You see that? He was busy doing the work. He was busy preaching. He was busy busy teaching, he was busy healing, taking care of people. And uh, when it comes to ministry, we can be busy about some things and fail at the next section here. It says here, but when he saw the multitudes. So he's going about his business, doing his work. It says, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And uh, I'm not preaching this. I'm just, I just want to give it by way of introduction. Uh, Jesus is perfect. We all understand that, right? <laughs> but here, even the Lord Jesus Christ, in his humanity, he's busy and he's doing some things. And it took him a moment where he stopped and looked out. And there he was moved with compassion. You know, every once in a while when we're busy doing things, we need to take a stop and look around and see people. And just look at it for a moment. I'm not telling you to stare at him, look at him funny, but just observe him and look at what's going on and let God stir your heart. Let God stir your heart. I'll talk more about that in just a moment. So he sees them there. He has compassion on them because they fainted. They were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, 
But the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this account of your own son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, there's so many things that we can learn in this these few verses. The Lord has become uh, into our emphasis today, Missions Emphasis Day. Lord, I really, I pray that it wouldn't be just an emphasis day, but it would be emphasis for life. And God, I ask that uh, you would just stir us for people and help us to see through your eyes. May we get a little glimpse tonight. In Jesus' name, I pray and ask these things. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. Jesus prayed for a lot of specific things. You know, uh, he prayed for the saints. <laughs> During that time, you know, he prayed for his disciples. He prayed for his future disciples. You see that in John chapter 17. Of course, the Apostle Paul implores uh, people in Ephesians chapter number 6 to pray always, right? <laughs> With all prayer and supplication, right? For the saints. And so there's specific things that we ought to pray for. If you go through the scriptures, there's a lot of things, a lot of dynamics to the avenue of prayer. And I, I'm just going to give one specific area here to pray for laborers, to pray for laborers. Well, how do we get to the point where we really make that an integral part of our life? You know, it's one thing to sit down and you know, say, Lord, please uh, send some laborers uh, into your harvest. But how can we be moved to pray with zeal and emphasis and maybe more specifics in areas? I think we can take a note from the Lord Jesus Christ here. Let me reread verses uh, 36, 37, and 38. It says, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as, having, uh, as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, the, tr the harvest truly is plain, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. I'm going to just try to move quickly tonight. What, what did the Lord Jesus Christ do? Well, first of all, he saw the multitudes. He saw the multitudes. If we're going to pray for the laborers to be sent into the harvest, then we first must see the multitudes and the state in which uh, they rest in. Uh, we got to get a view of where they're at physically. we got to get a great view of where that really they are eternally. Uh, there are some cold, hard facts in the scriptures that sometimes we try and bypass and make things kind of fluffy every once in a while. Uh, come Sunday morning, I preached, I preached on hell. You know, I, I made the statement that that's not an easy message to preach. And it's not. It's not my enjoyable mess. I don't like getting up and preaching on it. It's not fun when I'm looking out into the crowd. You know, it's not one of those messages where you get a lot of amens, where people get, uh, they get all excited about it. And by the way, if somebody got excited about hell, I think that'd be a little weird, don't you? It's a very somber message. It gets people to think. And, uh, and they're not easy uh, messages. But we need those messages because if we don't get those messages, then it's easy to forget about things like that. We forget that there is a real hell. We talk about heaven and we think about eternity and maybe someday, hey, listen, we're going to go there. We're going to walk on the street of gold. And, hey, we're going to have a mansion of our own and we're going to see Jesus face to face. And hey, listen, we get to, uh, we get to uh, partake of the tree of life and the river of life and it's going to be glory. There's going to be no pain and no tears and no heartache. What glory? But we forget about, hey, wait a minute. There's also in there, there's also, uh, there's a judgment day, the white throne judgment, where people are cast into the lake of fire. That's real. And uh, we ought to be on guard with our heart that we don't forget about that, and we lack then compassion. And honestly, what it ends up doing is we excuse then our laziness in the work of God. And I'm talking about me now. So here, what are some facts concerning the multitudes? Why was he moved with compassion? Well, it gets here uh, uh, three things. Three things. It says, first of all, it says because they fainted. So they are faint. They are faint. Uh, the Bible says, for all of sin that come short of the glory of God. We understand that there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that doeth good, right? There's none that seeketh after God. We are on all an unclean thing. Listen, our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the eyes of God, right? The best we can do. Uh, we fade as a leaf, right? 
We fade as a leaf. We're, I mean, the, the human race thinks sometimes they're invincible, but I think this little virus came through and reminded everybody, hey, we're not as invincible as we thought we were. Whenever I look at the scriptures, even though those verses, I have them memorized, and I know those verses, but when I sit and I think about it, and then I look out on people and I see them, and they're in their sin, I'm like, man, look at them. They're so weary. They weary themselves, their faith within their sin. They grope in darkness. They try and try and try and figure things out. I mean, they weary themselves to figure out all life's problems. And there's only one place that can give them the answer. Their faith. Their faith. There was, uh, growing up and living in my home, you know, obviously we had television and we watched things and there's commercials uh, that were on. And I remember, and I, they're probably still on, I just don't know because I don't watch it. <laughs> but they had the, the commercials trying to get people to donate at least a dollar or something like that to feed the hungry. And they would show the pictures, you know, of places in South America or places in Africa. And they'd show these little kids in their rags and you know, I built clothes and, and it just lived in dirt and all those types of things. And, and it was stuff that they were they were eating wasn't healthy and all those types of things. And you know why they do that? So well, because they want your money. Well, yeah. <laughs> but they're trying to get you to look at it so that you will have compassion. The Bible says, mine eye affecteth my heart. Mine eye affecteth my heart. You know, when I go in uh, and we go visit on Saturdays, typically, sometimes it's early, but when we go and visit, uh, especially our, our bus kids, the kids that ride. Now, not every one of them has a home that's absolutely 100% deplorable and that type of thing, but many of them live in circumstances, and they don't even realize how bad it is. Mm -hmm. They open the door, and sometimes it, they open the door, and the smell that hits, you're like, whoa. And you get to look around in there, and you get to look around at all the filth that they live in. I'm talking about, we're, we're in America, and I don't know if we like that, but they live in filth. Food all over the floor, and hasn't been cleaned up, mashed right into the carpet. They got pets and things like that that, you know, do their thing all over the place. Sometimes it's somewhat cleaned up, sometimes it's not. You go to some of the houses, I've gone through... And I had to watch myself just getting up to the house. I'm like dodging stuff. You know what I'm talking about? So they didn't get all over my feet. So that I can bring it in my car. Stink up the whole car. Yeah. Dang. Now look at that. Dang. Those kids are going to grow up in that. And they're going to live like that. And they're going to pass that on. And something can fix all that. Somebody's got to bring them a different message. A different way of living. And most of the problem on why they live like that is because there's a parent that's neglectful because of sin that they're involved in. You know, it's more it's more important to the parent to get out and do their drugs or drink their alcohol and all those types of things and let everything else go. They're passed out in the mornings. The kids are up by then and doing their own thing, fending for themselves. And that's in America. Sometimes we'll come back to the vehicle, my wife and I'll come back, and we'll just look at each other and the tears start swelling up in our eyes. It's better than that. It can be better than that. When I was working other bus routes in East Knoxville, you'd go to the doors and, and, and you'd see the bullet holes in the brick. You talk to some of the kids, and I think I gave this story before, but I talked to some of the kids and I mean, they'd seen things that I'd never seen before. I mean, they, they had one of the abandoned apartment complexes there. Uh, some of the kids, you know, they shouldn't be playing in there. They're not supposed to be, right? <laughs> but they're kids. And so, hey, what's in there? Well, they scary ghosts. Well, some of them crawled in there and decided they would go look around. They crawled in there, and guess what they found? Dead bodies. I think, man, they got it better than this. There's somebody who gave them something better than this. The anger that's in some of them. I mean, I'm talking about kids that are just, I mean, they're, I mean, they're probably this tall. And the anger and the bitterness and all those things. And you look at them, man, man, man. Hey, they're faint. 
their faith. The Lord Jesus Christ, in the midst of all of what he was doing, he says, listen, I, he stopped for a moment and he saw the multitudes and he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted. They were weary, wearied by sin. We had a young man that came in on Sunday, sat in here. I want to be careful. But I got, I took him to a place after service, tried to talk to him a little bit. I got hold and I told my wife, I said, I can't help him. Right? I can't help him. You say, Pastor, you can't. I know I couldn't help him. I can't help Jesus can help him, but I can't help him. I can point him to Jesus. They gotta listen. You can't have somebody that doesn't listen. But I looked at him. Anybody else notice what he was wearing? Well, how did he get that way? Sin. He's faith with sin. Let our eyes, you know, we somebody could like that could come in and we could. If we could smell them or whatever and look at them, we're like, ooh. Or we could let it move us with compassion. Hey, they need Christ. They need Christ. They're faint. Uh, number two, it says they're scattered. So he says not only that, are, are they faint, but he says they were scattered abroad. They're scattered abroad. Now, the word scattered literally means to be cast out or thrown out. They're scattered abroad. And... Uh, <clears throat> It's not necessarily a personal, uh, purposeful, like somebody picked them up and, and threw them down, but they are scattered. They're thrown out, they're cast out, they're just scattered around uh, out there. They're just kind of wandering through life, so to speak. And he's looking at them, and he's watching them, maybe hustle and bustle, but they're scattered out there, going to this place and going to that place and doing this thing, and just scattered, just thrown here and there and everywhere because of sin. They're scattered. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. The soul that sinned, it shall die. Wherefore, by one man's sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So death passed upon all men, so that all have sinned. The Bible says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You know, if somebody sows to their flesh, what does the Bible say? Of their what? Flesh will reap what? Corruption. I've never met anybody that's involved in sin that isn't scattered. <laughs> they never settled. They're always this way and that way and scattered. Uh, This week, just this week, I found out some things about some people I know, people I love, people I care about. Young family. Three kids. Some things have happened. Sin entered in. Scattered the family. Scattered. Now it's Kids stay with mom for this time, and kids stay with dad for this time, bounce back and forth and scatter. Scatter. Cast around. Why? Sin. They're scattered. When Jesus looked at it, it moved him with compassion. Not only were they scattered, but number three, They needed leadership, spiritual leadership. He saw that they didn't have any leadership. It says they fainted, they were scattered abroad, and it says as sheep having no shepherd. Nobody ran them in. Nobody to say, hey, come this way. Nobody to tell them what was right. Nobody to give them direction. Just wandering around. Now, I don't know a whole lot about sheep. I don't. I just don't know a whole lot about sheep. I'm not. I, know, I do know this, they're not real smart. 
and uh, God likens me to a sheep, so that tells you where I'm at. They're not real smart. Some stories I've read about sheep and things, you know, they just, they'll just kind of drift off. You know, they just kind of do their thing. They just start going, hey, look, what's over here? Not paying attention to what's going on. They don't care about the dangers that are there. You know, they just kind of go. They got to have somebody to rein them in. You know, sheep are very feeble. They're easily broke down. They're easily picked on. They don't have a lot of defense systems. In fact, I don't think they really have much of a defense system at all except for the shepherd. They've got to have somebody to guide them. They have to have somebody to give them direction. they got to have somebody to say, hey, stay away from there. And Jesus was looking at them and saying, listen, somebody's got to be able to tell them. Somebody's got to give them direction. They're wandering around here. They're scattered abroad. They're faint. They're weary in their sin. And they don't have anybody to tell them anything different. Now, Jesus... The world, he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He's the good shepherd, isn't he? He's the door. There's not salvation in any other, correct? There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, right? He is it. You think about all the damage that religion has. Think about it. The people that are religious are still faint and scattered abroad, and they still have no shepherd. He says, hey, listen, they need a spiritual shepherd. They need somebody that's going to take notice. They're going to, they need somebody that's going to watch out for them. That's what they need. And he was moved with compassion. Now, he saw this, so he looked. But then he turns to his disciples in verse number 37, and he tells them what the problem is concerning this. He says, in verse 37, he says, Then said, saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. The laborers are few. Now I gave you information uh, not too long ago concerning missions and missionaries and uh, how... In the 50s, in the 50s, I think there was at least 100,000 missionaries sent out of America, and that's just been dwindling down and down and down and down. And there's more people that come off the field than go on the field. And uh, there's also, when we talk about people that are on deputation, about 50% of them make it. That's not good statistics. That's bad. And I think the problem is, is because... Uh, God's people have forgotten to look out and be moved with compassion on the people that are scattered abroad, faint, having no shepherd. They need somebody to tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. They need somebody to go. The fact is, is that there are some regions in the world that there are nobody. There is not a voice of the gospel. Do you know that? Now, I know there's closed places but hold on a second. We say closed. But God can hold to anything. Maybe the problem isn't that it's closed as much as it, the area is closed as much as people's hearts are closed. Well, we can't go over there. I remember uh, after 9-11 took place and uh, <clears throat> many of you would remember that day when you heard the news, and maybe the thoughts and the emotions that went through your mind. And every, for everybody's a little bit different, right? And of course, everybody's like, almost everybody was like, hey, we gotta take care of this thing. And you know, there's this a rise of patriotism, right? And uh, there's people that began to pray and things like that. Uh, but one of the disturbing things that came out of that is this, is that uh, <clears throat> the lack of compassion or lack of love towards uh, Islamic people. Say, what do you mean? Don't they need Christ just like anybody else? I met people, I'm talking about Christian people that thought all of them should die. Well, if they die, where are they going? Do 
You hear me? If they die, where are they going? They're going to go to hell. That's where they're going to go. Because they believe in a false god, right? They don't believe in the gospel. They don't believe Jesus is God, right? And so that's where they're going to go. But I know a few people, I have some friends, that went over there not too long after 9-11. They went over there, and they went into Iraq. And they helped set up a radio station. And when they were there, here's what happened. As they were working, they saw. They saw people that were faint, scattered abroad, having no shepherd. And their hearts were moved with compassion. And they looked at the thing and they didn't say, hey, this is a black hole. They said, the fields are white as a harvest. But the laborers are few. And then God said, well, why don't you be one? And so they went. Yeah. So they went. The fact is, I'm talking about just in our independent Baptist colleges. Listen to this. Every year, there are not just hundreds that graduate, there's thousands that graduate in all the colleges. Thousands. Where are they? What are they doing? Where are the laborers? And we send people over those places to get their education for ministry and things like that. And uh, they get this degree and then they get done and then they, I don't know what happens to them. Some of them don't make it all the way through. When I was, uh, my graduating class from when I started as a freshman to the time I had finished was half the size by the time I finished in four years. It was half the size. But then we graduated, you know, those those that group graduated. And can I tell you something? I have I don't know where half of them are. You say, well, you don't keep in touch with them. I did for a while, and then I lost touch because they disappeared out of the ranks of doing anything for God. <laughs> Just gone. Here they are, equipped. Some of them grew up in church and they know the ministries and they, they know the doctrine and they know what to do. They're skilled in the labor, but hey, where are they? Where are they? Yeah. Now we're small here, our church. But I don't believe for a minute that God doesn't want to send people out in this church. And I know he has from in the past. Well, I'm talking about future-wise. We ought to always be tender to that. Always be tender to that. It doesn't, I'm talking about it, it doesn't matter what age you are. <laughs> we ought to be tender to that. There's people that I know that, I mean, Dr. Ron Williams, uh, all the years of ministry that he spent dealing with uh, the girls and the girls' home and all those things, and they had to shut down. Now he has to revamp and he's going out to evangelism. And I read his latest prayer letter and he says, you know, it's odd, you know, at this age, of me uh, changing ministry like I am kind of stepping out into new waters. But I praise God. He, he's looking at it saying, hey, I'm still a laborer. I'm still a laborer, right? And so he sees that, but the laborers are few. The problem is not that there's people that out there that aren't, aren't willing to receive Christ. There are people out there. And I know there's places that are a little bit tougher. And there's places that are a little bit harder. And it seems like maybe where the, the, the gospel when it goes out, it seems to ring on deaf ears, so to speak. But there's one or there's two. There's still somebody there. The problem is not that there's not enough people to witness to. The problem is we don't have enough people out witnessing to them. That's the problem. That the problem here in Butte is not the fact that there aren't enough sinners. There's plenty of them. Pastor Burks has talked about There's plenty of sinners within this town. There just needs to be enough people going out giving the gospel, right? Yeah. In, the, in, a, in a year, we, I mean, we, we had to stop a lot of things. But uh, when we started, when we started firing up back door knocking. You can see where it's highlighted on the map over there. Where we started door knocking and those types of things. You know, I started looking at that and I'm like, man, it's taking a long time to cover ground. This is bigger. This is a bigger city than you, you know you, you first look at. But the more people that go out, the more ground can be covered. Yeah. Yeah. The laborers are few. That's the problem. 
So what do we do? We say, well, labors are few. You know, we need help. And, those, and I believe that. You know, I believe we need help in some several areas. So what's the answer to this? Well, you know, first of all, we got to look at, look at it, right? we got to see. Right? we got to see. I want to encourage everybody, and, and I know one of the things that, and I, the reason I'm saying this is because I want you to understand uh, Pastor Dirksen's heart on some things when he brought me this way. One of the first things he did is we drove up to the top over there and looked down across the city. Because up there you can see pretty much everything. You say, well, it's just a city. But see, here in my, in my eyes, his eyes, it's not a city where you're looking at buildings. Every building that I'm looking at there is representing there's people that live in that building. There's people that work in that building. Every place is just full of people. Buildings don't mean a whole lot to me. I didn't come to a place just to look at buildings and try and, oh, that's nice. <laughs> that's good architecture right there. That's pretty cool. There's people. I want to encourage all of you, maybe within the next month, maybe take a drive up to the top and look down. They don't see a city, see people. And then stir you. Say, hey, there's somebody down there that's not saved. Somebody down there that needs Christ. Somebody down there that's faint. Somebody down there that's weary. Somebody down there that's scattered. And they have no shepherd. And they need Lord. Let it move you. Okay, so you first need to see, okay? You need to sit, you need to look at it. And then next is this, we need to ask. I think it's harder uh, for us to ask appropriately and more specifically if we don't first see them. So go see. And then let's ask the Lord to send labors. This is what he says in verse number 38. He says, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Now, don't you think God wants to answer that prayer? I mean, Jesus said pray for it, didn't he? He didn't say it because he didn't think the Father would answer that prayer. He said it because he knows the Father's heart, right? And he understands, hey, listen, he wants to send people, right? So the problem is not that people aren't being trained to do the work now. Listen to me very clear. I just mentioned it. We have a lot of Bible colleges. Well, we have a lot of churches that have trained people over the years. We have the training. That's not the problem. The problem is not that there's not enough people to do the job because there are. The problem is not that there's not enough resources to get it done because there are. The problem is not the fact that a preacher is not preaching about dedication to the Lord Jesus Christ and his cause. Because I believe for the most part, they are. Uh, there's preachers all over the United States that stand up in pulpits from Sunday to Sunday and evangelists, those types of things, preaching and saying, listen, the, the, the harvest is plenteous, it's wide, it's ready to go. We just need some laborers, we need some preachers, we need some missionaries, we need some people that are dedicated for the cause of Christ, we need some Sunday school teachers, we need some people that run the bus ministry, we need some more people that are out in children's ministry, we need some people out in the jail ministry, we need some people out in the recovery ministry. That's being preached. I don't think it's not being preached, that's it's being preached. You say, well, is it being preached here? You just heard it. I don't think that's the problem. I don't think the problem is that the Holy Spirit just stopped working. He has the same power today as he did back in the apostolic age when he set the whole church on fire, right? And 3,000 people were saved and baptized in one day. That hasn't changed. I think the problem is, in my life, is I haven't taken it seriously in the avenue of prayer. Now, I can preach my lungs out that people need to surrender to Christ, the call of God, those type of things. But if I don't pray God will send people, then what good is that going to do? I think everybody here would like to see churches grow, though. Especially this one, right? We're here, right? And uh, I don't think there's, I haven't heard any complaints that we don't have, you know, programs and things we do. It's a blessing. We have Sunday school and we have 
a junior church, you know, when, when we're allowed to have it. <laughs> and we have a bus ministry and those types of things. We have jail, we have outreach, several outreach ministries. And a nursing home, right? Uh, that's not the complaint. But if it's going to expand at any point, it has to have laborers to do it. It just does. You have to have more teachers. You have to have, if you're going to run more bus routes, you got to have more people driving buses. You got to have more people captains of the buses. We have to have more people that would be able to enable us to buy more buses, right? I think we should get bigger ones. What do you think, Richard? Yeah. That way, if this ever happens again, we can spread them out real good. <laughs> that or just have a little to fill them up, right? Yeah. Although I kind of like those little buses. They were doing real well. What I'm saying is this. Is if we're going to see laborers go out, then we've got to be serious about planning for it. When I was started the church in Frenchtown, People would come in and uh, they would stick around for a little while and then they'd leave and I'd ask them, well, where are you going? And they say to this church or that church or whatever. So why are you going over there? And this is what they would say to me. They'd say, you know what, we enjoy your preaching. And I thought, you're lying to me, aren't you? I don't even enjoy my preaching. But they would say, we enjoy your preaching. And they'd say, but you don't, you know, you don't have this program, you don't have that program, you don't have this and that and that. And I'm like, well kind of hard to do that. It's just me and my wife doing it. It's a little hard for me to preach here and run a teen program at the same time. And we did what we could, where we could. We rearranged schedule things. But here's the problem. You know, we did it and I, I said, Lord, we need laborers. That's what we need to do. We need laborers. But I'm going to tell you a fault of mine. I said it for a while and then it would be a while before I go back to it and I think about it. And I've come to the conviction that one of my greatest faults in prayer life is praying for laborers. Just praying for them. And so tonight, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to be done here in a moment. Uh, as we come into this missions emphasis day, I want us to pray for laborers. People that will get in and work. That's why it's called laborers, right? And uh, get a part, be a part. And uh, I want us to pray for our church. You know, we pray for our ministries and, and those things. But I want us to specifically tonight, I want us to pray for laborers for each of those ministries. Let's pray for laborers for the bus ministry. Let's pray for laborers in our Sunday school ministry. And we've got Sunday school teachers, but really they need, they need somebody else in there with them. I think that's good. That's a lot of wisdom just to have a helper in there. You know, when a kid has to go to the bathroom and the teacher has to leave, that's not good when the rest of the kids are there, <laughs> right? Yeah, or something happens. But also, they need somebody in there that they can train. We all get sick. Things happen, right? We need somebody to take the place there. Plus, if we want to expand, that's your next teacher, and then they get somebody to train, right? That's how that works. So we pray for our, our bus ministry. We pray for our Sunday school. We pray for our children's uh, ministries, junior church, right? I'd like to fire up a, a midweek program again. Pray for that. Our jail ministry. Now, Pastor Dirksen's over that. That's what he does. But you know, what if he's sick? Or what if something else comes in? Other other people need to be able to go in there. Yeah, minister, prison. We've got a gap there. Now, I don't know when they'll let us in, but we have a gap there because Brother Mike is gone. So we have a gap there where somebody could go in, you file your paperwork, get approved, and go in and be able to talk to those guys, give them the Bible, right? Give them the Bible. The door of hope. I was thinking about this preacher ministry and uh, a lot of those people need a lot of one on one that's just the way it goes and they, they like their groups and things like that but a lot of them really need a lot of one on one attention that's just the, the nature of it but in order for that to happen you gotta have a lot of laborers to be able to give that one on one attention I think it'll 
I think, in the world. But we need laborers for that. People that are trained to have a heart and look at them and say, hey, and tell them the hard things. Like, hey, dumb dumb, you can't keep doing this. Now you love them. They, they know you love them. So you got to tell them, hey, that, no, that's not wise. No, you got to go get a job. No, you got to get up in the morning. You got to get some character in there and kind of get on them. Like, sometimes maybe you even have to, like, call them and wake them up and say, like, no. It's just the way it is. But that's the way that ministry is going to be. But it'll grow. Our missions. You know, we support quite a few missionaries. That's a blessing, isn't it? Amen. But if we have more missionaries coming off the field, and you look, we have some, we have some people kind of younger and kind of maybe in the middle age bracket. But there's some older missionaries up there, and in a while they're going to have to come off the field, or they'll die there. But who's going to take their place? Who's going to go into the Middle East? Who's going to go into communist China? We've got missionaries that maybe stay here in Japan. We need somebody else to go over there. There's a lot of people in Japan. <laughs> Some of you say South America is inundated, but there's areas there that need the gospel. We need another brother to go to these harder reach places. We need that. But you can't work that. Listen, God called me to preach. None of you could coax me into it or out of it. <laughs> but I wonder if there was somebody that was praying for laborers and God said, how about you, bud? I think so. 